an imperfect leader, leadership in after action is supported by ILAA, a firm dedicated to supporting aspiring new and established leaders. For more information, please find them at human-centeredleaders.com. Hello, imperfect leaders. I am so excited. My new book, An Imperfect Leader, Human-Centered Leadership in After Action is now available. You can order it by going to Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I've seen it online in lots of bookstores. And if you like it, would you please leave a positive review? Thank you so much for your support. In the final chapter of my book, I reveal that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was my aunt. In fact, I include a quote from a speech that my aunt once sent me, written in honor of an award she had received. She wrote, in the open society that is the American ideal, no doors should be closed to people willing to spend hours of effort needed to make dreams come true. So hold fast to your dreams and work hard to make them a reality. And as you pursue your paths in life, leave tracks. Just as others have been way pavers for you, so you should aid those who will follow in your way. Do your part to help move society to the place you would like it to be for the health and well-being of generations following your own. Yes, she borrowed a line from Langston Hughes, but she also captured how I feel about the future of public education. Education in America will never be the same. The decisions we make now and the ability to reach our kids in a meaningful way will be our contribution to the generation that follows us. My guest today does just that. In the many roles she plays in her school district, Barbara Hefner is agitating for change for the health and well being of generations following her own. And about halfway through the conversation, she shares some charming anecdotes about the U.S. Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, who grew up in her school district of Meriden, Connecticut, and was a teacher and a leader in the school district. Thanks for tuning in. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Barbara Hefner is my guest. Barbara is the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Innovation for the Meriden Public Schools in Meriden, Connecticut. She handles K-12 district curriculum. She deals with parental issues related to instruction. She clarifies board policy and school procedures for parents and the community. And she's responsible for the successful rollout of the Teacher and Leader Evaluation Development Plan. And, and then also an interesting tidbit, she co-authored the book, The Great Equalizer, Six Strategies to Make Public Education Work in America. And that was co-published by Rowan and Littlefield and AASA. And so, as you can tell, she handles many of the more difficult aspects of a school system. So you can see why I wanted to talk with her. Barbara, welcome to An Imperfect Leader. Thank you for having me. So, Barbara, I have to say it's so wonderful to see you again for our listeners. I had the honor of sitting next to Barbara at a dinner for the Connecticut Superintendents Association, and I couldn't wait to find a time to keep our conversation going. And you know, what I've since learned about you is that I'm going to take a deep breath because there's so many things here. You've worked with staff and students in Meriden and throughout the state of Connecticut to integrate technology tools and digital content in the K-12 curriculum. You've presented to ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education, the American Association of School Administrators for the Yukon Executive Leadership Program, the Connecticut Educators Computer Association, as well as many other places. It's unbelievable. And as I look back to when you first started leading in this area and then through the pandemic and then after when we were back into in-person learning, what was a significant learning or takeaway about the role of technology in the success of children? Well, when I started in the district, which was 13 years ago, we were a district like many that wasn't one-to-one. -one. We had a handful of devices for our students to use. And at the time, my role was supervisor of technology. So we began looking at how we could get devices into the hands of our students. In a very short time, we began our digital transformation. We saw firsthand that technology had an impact on students' academic success and their engagement. So we started with a set of iPads in one classroom with a teacher who was re ready to implement a crazy idea. Let's put these expensive devices into the hands of students and we were going to let them take them home. So I would visit the classroom regularly to see how things were going, what was working, was the technology making a difference? And the biggest change point in my career was when I was talking to a, a two students who were a set of twins and I was asking them if technology really played a role in their learning. They were talking about the different ways that they use the technology. But when they had to hand their devices in at the end of the school year, they would have to go back home and share a computer to do their homework at night. 
And I remember driving back to central office from the high school thinking, what are we doing to students? We're giving them a tool. We're showing them all the benefits of using the tool. And then we say, thank you for coming. Now go on with your high school career because you're no longer in this class. So when I got back to the building here, it was immediate conversation with my colleagues saying, we need to rethink this um, and we need to do something to solve this problem. Because if anyone was to take away our devices, we wouldn't be able to function. I'm very fortunate where I've worked with a very consistent leadership team in the district for my 13 years here. So they agreed with me and they said, great, start looking for solutions. How do we get more devices into the hands of students? Fortunately, um, price points started changing, so that helped. Um, but we went to our students and we said, do you like the iPad? Is there a device that you think that would be better? Um, and so we've gone the gamut with, of devices. So at first, students wanted the small tablets and price point was perfect for those. We could buy a lot and get them out. And then students said, we think keyboards would be more beneficial for us, that we need this as a working tool, not just a communication tool. And so we moved to some laptops, but eventually the price point of the Chromebook came to a point where we could buy devices for everyone. And we were at a point where we had devices in every classroom. We were partnering with vendors and we really wanted true partnerships with our vendors to bring digital content into the classroom. The content had to be aligned with what we were teaching in the classroom and really had to support student learning and provide teachers with data that was meaningful data, not just usage data. And then the pandemic hit. And very quickly, we had to shift gears. We came together on a Sunday morning and we we're fortunate. Our teachers union and our administrators union joined us at the table. We rolled up our sleeves and we all said, now what? These are all the pieces that we have in place. How can we leverage these pieces so that we can keep learning going amidst this time that we're all very unsure of what our next steps are going to be? Um, so our IT department stepped up as well. We opened a help desk that was both in English and Spanish for families. Any device that was in school that wasn't taken home that Friday when schools closed, we had places for families to come in and take them home. We had hotspots um, that we were handing out. And really, in true transparency, um, we had a, a great learning curve with Google Meets and Zoom. And when I think about the passion and dedication that our staff had across the board to leverage the technology to meet this, the needs of students, um, we were really very fortunate. At a time where people were hesitant to say, what is this video call that we're going to do? Now people use it seamlessly. And then that brings us to today where like we've learned many lessons about the use of technology. I mean, we no longer will have discussions where what role does technology play in student learning? It plays a role and finding an appropriate role for that is, is what we continue to do. We don't have discussions about access anymore because we know students need access not only in the building and outside the classroom. And, you know, we did things like parent-teacher conferences online during the pandemic, and we've continued that practice till this day. We had our highest response from parents because parents are able to jump on a Google Meet and meet with the child's teacher as opposed to leaving work and coming to meet with us. We now offer PD options that are online for teachers that are either synchronous or asynchronous, depending on the offerings. And for our students, we've looked at classes. We have two high schools. But we also look at what can we offer in an online environment if we don't have a large enrollment, but still can offer these opportunities uh, for teachers. So technology, while we had a lot in place, the pandemic really gave us the opportunity to look at schools of places for learning, for academic content, social skills, and to enhance students' technology skills so they become lifelong learners. Wow. <laughs> I'm thinking about this whole arc of the story of you being in that classroom with that those iPads when they were first being adopted to now where parent-teacher conferences are done uh, virtually, professional development opportunities are, are provided virtually, students have opportunities to take additional courses or classes online so that fits their schedules and their interests, because sometimes even if you have two high schools, there are classes and interests that students have that we as districts just can't provide that opportunity. You know, an example would be students who want to learn Arabic. 
You may not have an Arabic speaking teacher or one who's certified to teach Arabic, and yet they still have access now through this incredible landscape that is a virtual landscape. One of the things that you said that I really tuned into that I don't often hear, two things actually. One was you engage and involve students in the choice of the devices that you are going to adopt. And I think that's really important. During the pandemic, it also sounds like you brought teachers and administrators and their unions to the table because you make decisions with those who are most impacted. I wonder, would you talk a little bit about that decision to bring students into the decision-making process? How did their voice help you make a more predictably successful choice in terms of the tools being used? Sure. So when we started with the iPads, you know, the iPad was the new glossy tool that everyone wanted. Um, So the adoption was really easy. Who wouldn't want the new device? Um, And then when we said to students, you know, we can look at devices, what works best for you. We knew price point wise, we, we just couldn't do it with an iPad. So students said, we need something we could fit in our backpack, something that's very portable. And we include our students in a lot of the decisions that we make. We we want student voice because their perspective is so valuable. And we want the tools to be useful for them. You know, we have say in the tools we use, whether it's a pencil, a pen, or the type of device, you know, students have a voice and really will share what they want. It was very interesting to me though, when we had the small tablets in the hands of all the students and when we're in the schools working and talking with them and how's it go you know how's it going does this work well for you what are the downfalls you know students were very strong when they came back and said this is a tool that i can look on the internet for information for but if i have to be a producer of work it's not the best tool for me and so getting their input was so valuable. Otherwise, we probably would have continued buying more tablets. They were inexpensive. We could hand them out. Um, so it it really changed the trajectory of where we were going. And we still use student input for a variety of things that we do today. Um, our students are reps on the Board of Education, so they report out at every meeting. But we'll hold student focus groups, get student input, the superintendent, And the Board of Ed president meet with the high school students uh, on a pretty regular basis just to say what's working, what's not working. And what's great is we learn that students have a real passion for their schools, for their teachers, for each other's. And then they do really make some great suggestions of things as the adults in the world we can change to make learning a better experience for them. So having them involved is key. Yeah, you think about the fact that we teach critical thinking and things like that, and then we say, well, but duh, we don't want to know what you think about the actual operation of our organization. <laughs> Just do your thinking somewhere else. So, no, I'm, that's really exciting. The, the second piece I wanted to highlight, I thought, and I hadn't heard this very much, is there's often tension between curriculum coordinators or the assistant soups who are, uh, who are tasked with um, leading curriculum and the IT department. And it sounds like in your role, you are doing both and then have sort of the operations part of IT as the support to your department. I'm thinking, is that an intentional decision made by by your school district because you bring a unique set of skills? And is that something that you have been recommending or or advising other districts to really consider the consolidation or, or at least bringing together curriculum and technology tools as part of the same department. So when I started, I was responsible for just the the technology, the educational technology and the hardware side with a team of people. But I always had a seat at the table with all of the curriculum uh, people, which was great because they would have curriculum ideas. They would be thinking about, at that point, technology and the use of digital content was so new. Does it work on the flat platform? Can we install the software? So they, I was always included in, in part of those conversations. And I think that's due to the structure of our district. As my role evolved over the years, um, my title went from supervisor of technology to director of curriculum and technology because it became to the point where it was seamless. And I've always um, was a strong advocate for technology as a tool, but it has to be aligned with the curriculum. If, if it's not embedded into our core, and part of the way that we're doing instruction every day, it's going to sit on the outskirts and it'll be that fun activity, but the value added may not necessarily be there. 
So what I also learned about you when we were sitting next to each other is that you worked closely with our U.S. Secretary of Education, Secretary Cardona. And um, I didn't realize this, but I have learned that n not only did he grow up in Meriden, but he also served as a teacher and an administrator. And in fact, I think you succeeded him as the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and, and Learning, as what it was called then and now Innovation. Would you take a moment, if it's not too much of an imposition, to tell us a little bit about our Secretary of Education? So Dr. Cardona is a great guy. I've had the opportunity to work with him for many years, and we've been in many different roles in the district working together. Um, he's a strong advocate for public education, and he's always a teacher at heart. Even though he had left the classroom, he still carried that true teaching passion in all that he did in the district. Um, his son graduated from one of our high schools. His daughter's currently at one of our high schools. His wife uh, works with us in the district as well, where she supports students in their post-secondary plans and also supports families in making those plans. They're a very tight-knit family and know the value of family, and they're very supportive to other families. Um, Dr. Cardona's immediate family is also in the community. Um, they're very musically inclined, and there are times um, when the Cardona family will be performing. And sometimes we may even see him perform, though he will say his wife, his children, and his parents and siblings are much more uh, talented. But it, it's fun to be able to see him around the community and his support of the community. I mean, he, he's always been a huge technology advocate. And when I used to oversee IT, I would chuckle because the text would say, oh, we're going out to work with Dr. Cardona. We're sure he needs an, an, another hard drive or an external hard drive for his photos, his, his videos. He was always capturing great moments that were happening with students, with families. Um, and it's funny, when he had his, received his new position as Secretary of Education, we were talking to some of his staff and we said, just FYI, there'll be a lot of pictures being taken. And <laughs> I know now that he's traveling all over the United States, all over the world, um, just by looking at his Twitter feed and things that are on social media, he, he continues to document, but but definitely a true advocate and a true teacher for public education. I love that personal story of his family and and music. I, in, in my mind, as you were telling it, I was thinking of <laughs> the sound of music, the, the family Von Trump, you know, it's like <laughs> the family Cardona. But the other piece that I really enjoy hearing from you in terms of uh, your own personal recollections is the documentation of the things that are going so well in public education. I think we allow others to tell and write stories or, or create narratives about public education that simply are untrue. And if you're looking for innovation, if you're looking for inspiration, look no further than in our public schools throughout the nation. And so it's great to have a, a Secretary of Education who has an eye for and a heart for our children throughout our nation. So that's great. And we'll be right back. An Imperfect Leader is brought to you by Ed Connective, whose mission is to ensure student success through transformative teacher training. EdConnective helps teachers move from awareness about strategies and frameworks to successful and consistent implementation. Their friendly coaches celebrate classroom success with teachers and with concrete classroom data, support teachers in their growth, one step at a time. I've been thinking about this a lot. During the pandemic, student teachers didn't get a chance to do their student teaching with children. They just started teaching in classrooms and they need help across the nation States are adopting higher expectations to make up for learning loss. That's where Ed Connective fits in. Their vision is that every student deserves a great teacher, and every teacher deserves a great coach. Find out more by contacting them at edconnective.com. We're back for segment two of an imperfect leader called Imperfect Leadership in After Action. Barbara Hefner is my guest. Barbara is the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Innovation for the Meriden Public Schools in Meriden, Connecticut. In this segment, we ask our guests to deconstruct a decision that they have made, and then we discuss it. So, Barbara, what happened? Well, we were looking at our AP college-level courses for our students, and we were looking at subgroup enrollment, and we said, gee, we do not have enough students enrolled in our higher-level classes. We were a five-tier system. We collapsed, collapsed levels. Um, and became a three-tier system with an academic and accelerated and then the college level courses. Um, so we believe that public education provides all students with an opportunity to advance. And we really wanted 
to remove all barriers so that we could get more students interested in taking AP or college level courses. So I'm just gonna stop there for a second and just ask, so you mentioned the term subgroup. My mother listens to this. She will then send me a critical email that says something like, well, I don't understand what a subgroup is. So would you tell us what you mean by subgroup? Sure. So we, when we look at our data in the district, we always look by subgroup group, which is uh, looking at ethnicity is one way we look at it. And then we always look at special ed, non-special ed enrollment. So mom, what, um, what Barbara's talking about is the fact that when you look at AP courses across the nation, more likely than not, there's an, a disproportionate number of white and Asian students in the AP courses. And if your district is made up of, let's say, 40% African-American students, then you should expect that 40% of your students in your AP courses are going to be African-American. And so here is a district that is looking through an equity lens and saying to itself, we want to increase representation of our students in our advanced placement or college level courses. And so you've made some decisions. So what got overlooked as you were making these decisions? Well, we opened up classes to all students um, and we increased participation. We sent home letters to families that said, based on your PSAT scores and our climate survey data, um, you would be a perfect match for this class based on your interest. But what we quickly learned was we increased enrollment across the board, but we weren't having students su successful in the class. So we had to take a step back and say, now that we're increasing enrollment and we have the student interest, what do we need to do to support students so they were academically successful? In the district that I led, we had a similar process. We um, looked at every student's test scores. We looked at uh, teacher referrals. We, you know, every student's name was reviewed by teacher groups to say, oh my God, I, how is she not taking an advanced course? Yeah. And we met individually with students and said, this would be a, an important piece to your continued success. If you've taken an AP course, you're more likely to finish college. And one of the things that we discovered was that we didn't think about support we certain we just said we think you'd be great in this course and when students began to struggle they began meeting with their principals or their guidance counselors and saying i got i need to drop this course i don't know if that's similar to the experience you had one thing we heard from parents was look my kid's now getting a c in this course and we're going yeah but a c in an ap course they go no i want my child to be eligible for certain scholarships and to get into college so you're talking about finishing college my kids got to actually get in so I wonder, is that a similar type of conversation that you were hearing? Well, we definitely had similar concerns. And with the amount of work that's required in some advanced courses before the school year even starts, our students weren't used to saying, oh, I really have to do this summer work. It wasn't like reading the one novel for English and, oh, I didn't do well on the test and move on like it was years ago. Um, so we really said, oh, my gosh, parents are coming in upset. Kids are coming in feeling de deflated. And it's not the direction that we wanted. That was definitely not our intent. We were trying to build up uh, students and create success. So we, we had to look at a number of different things. And one of the things that we did was we did a summer AP boot camp. So if you're enrolled in a higher level course, it doesn't necessarily have to be AP, but that was the name that stuck. Um, we do a, a one week boot camp where you learn about study skills, um, allocating your time, chunking information. When it says to read two, three chapters over the summer, like you really need to do the work and the why behind it, because you'll get so far behind and you can't enjoy your high school experience. We've done things like we've created AP lounges in both of our high schools. So any student who's taking an advanced level course this year during their study period, they're scheduled in the AP lounge. So they're with other students who are taking advanced level courses. The feedback from students has been phenomenal. They like to be able to go to the lounge, work with their peers. The lounge is staffed with a tutor, but honestly, if I had to tutor someone in AP statistics, by the time I got to the point where I understood it to explain it again, the period may be over. So the students really like working together. We've also contracted with an online tutor. Um, so students could use the online tutor that's available 24 seven in the lounge. But if they're working and they get home from school late and they have questions, their teachers are very responsive. But we do know sometimes teenagers and their clock schedule is a little different from some of us. 
So if they're working on something late at night, they can reach out to a tutor um, where there's live tutoring who can help them work through the process. So some of those are some of the things that we've done to really support students so that they're successful. That's so interesting. The The second question I typically ask is, what did you learn about relationships? And it seems like one big learning is the fact that students love to learn from each other and providing that space and place for the positive peer pressure group, right? Uh, AP students in a, in a lounge together uh, promotes positive um, uh, experiences in terms of, I really got to study for this. And also that sort of peer tutoring of, this is where I'm confused and do you know can can we study together can you help me those types of things and when you get to a point where there may be additional need you recognize that the relationship that students have to their own sort of sleep schedules and their willingness to ask an adult in person may be somewhat limited so providing this external online platform for them to get tutoring would you add anything else about what you learned about relationships? The superintendent and board of ed president do roundtables with the high school students. And so when you're asking students, what do you think about your high school? Both high schools, interestingly enough, said the, uh, there was, the teacher in the AP lounge, who was really a tutor, is one of the best people in my uh, school because they care about me. They know to reach out to me. And I think because they work with a smaller group of students, as students are coming in, they're saying, OK, are you ready for this assignment? Do you need help? With it? It's those touch points to say there's a mm. caring adult in their life who's just kind of following through with them. And it's interesting because sometimes the attention students give their parents is different the, than the attention students give the adults in school um, because that's their mom or dad or adult in their life asking about them. This He's already is hassling it, them about everything. So, it, right, right. so the yeah. adult in that space is a consistent and reliable person who has been selected because that person also has that sort of superpower of interpersonal skills with, with teens. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's neat. And, I really wish if you could see these students working together, we have large movable whiteboards, they get the markers out, like it's being in a mini class some days, but to watch students so engaged in their learning and struggling through problems and coming to solutions, it, we really see the benefit there. I'm not sure if you're familiar with AVID, but it sounds like a very much like that type of AVID atmosphere with the, with the you know, where, where's the point where you were confused and now let's use this big whiteboard and do this together and students uh, participating together. That's really neat. Well, I, I can imagine that I'd be able to see it when our Secretary of Education comes to visit your high schools and takes a picture of it because no doubt that will Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Next time he's here, I will be Oh sure my gosh, you must tag that. me. That'd be amazing. Okay, <laughs> so what frustrated you as you were making this decision for all the right reasons to increase the uh, number of underrepresented students in higher level courses, knowing that that has a direct correlation to future success in terms of completing high school. I'm sorry, not just completing high school, but completing college. Um, what frustrated you? I think it was the lack of success that our students were seeing. Students were really trying to do the work and work hard, but they weren't doing the right time of work or they didn't know how to manage the work. So it was really saying, what do we need to do to, to step back and help them? We're asking them to take higher level courses that usually happen later on in their life. Developmentally, they may not be there. They came from a, or they're in a high school environment where we're breaking down information for them, all of a sudden they enroll in the next course and okay, here's a lot of things for you to tackle at once. And they just didn't know how to do it. And those are things that we can support them, that we can help them with. So that, that was probably like my biggest frustration that we got this, we can really help students. We just have to look at the how. And again, it came back to talking to students when we're saying, why aren't you seeing success in this course? Or why do you want to drop out when, you know, a child says, oh, I'm so overwhelmed. You're 15, 16 years old. We can help you with that most times, especially when it's with an academic course. Sure. One of the things that I also noticed is that when you agitate for change within a system, the system will often work sometimes aggressively to get back to stasis. And if students who have participated in AP courses traditionally um, that teachers had a perspective that students were more prepared, um, they may not be fully prepared for now a, a different set of needs, not intelligence, but needs in terms of the skills that children need to be successful. And when our school district was working on this, we believed that the mindset was very positive of, of course, whatever it takes. 
And then when students had additional needs, teachers may have felt unprepared to support. And I wonder, did you find that happening within that decision making process as well? We did because originally when students or teachers rather were teaching the higher level courses, it was all of the kids who did their homework. They followed the school rules, but dot your I's, cross your T's. Now, when we opened it up to all students without prerequisite classes, it was students who had a passion for learning. And like you said, they had the ability, but sometimes they just needed some structures in place to get them to that point. So that was a shift for our teachers. Um, but I'm happy to say they stepped up to the challenge. And actually, it was out of the teachers that they said, let's do an AP boot camp. You know, we're fortunate that a lot of our ideas that resonate through the district do come from our teachers. And again, it goes back to relationships and the communication we have with them. Well, clearly it's the cultural feel that exists within your system that individuals have the psychological safety to say, this isn't working as well as we would like it to. And so instead of raising a white flag and abandoning, it's to say, how can we make this work for everyone? So that's great. Um, in the end, what was something that was good that came out of the, the situation? Well, I have to say our enrollment numbers have increased. Our achievement has increased. We have students leaving both of our high schools with college level credits, which is a huge plus not only for the student, but financially for the family as well. And we do feel that as we're sending students off to college or careers, depending on their choice, um, that they are better prepared than they were even five years ago. Because we always say to students, even if you take the course and you don't do as well as you like, the experience and the rigor and grit that you have to put forth is a life lesson in itself. My guest again was Barbara Hefner. Barbara, I knew that when I was seated next to you at the Connecticut dinner that the universe had conspired to introduce me to a new colleague and a new friend. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. You are tasked with some of the more difficult jobs a leader can have, and it's clear there's a good reason why it's you. This has been a treat. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you for having me. Music for An Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created the Daruma Doll Butterfly artwork. Imperfect Leadership is not a scarlet letter. It is a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader, an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. And I'm proud to be an imperfect leader, so I hope you'll join me next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action.